What's going on, everyone? I'm just a typical average American here today to react and learn about Winston Churchill. Now, <laughs> uh, I have a bit of a confession to make. I, I don't really know who Winston Churchill is. I feel like I should. I've heard his name. And honestly, in some of the other videos I've watched and reacted to, Winston Churchill kept popping up and I was thinking, oh, that's a, that must be a really famous historical figure in the United Kingdom. Uh, I know he had something to do with politics, government. Honestly, if you had asked me, I might have even have told you he was had something to, to do with American history. Uh, because Winston Churchill was definitely, definitely taught in American school when I was growing up. I just personally, I feel like this is a me problem. I feel like a lot of Americans would be able to tell you who Winston Churchill is, especially those interested in history, where <laughs> unfortunately I don't know anything about anything, but you know, at least I'm aware of it and I can use it to my advantage, right? <laughs> it's an advantage to know nothing when you're uh, able to just pull up internet videos and learn things every day. It's amazing. What a what a day to be alive for me. Ah, thank you, internet. Anyway, I've rambled on too long. It is time for me to finally learn about Winston Churchill. He was born on November the 30th, 1874. Well, so just so I have my context right, um, this is... A hundred and... God, why is it such a weird date? <laughs> so, 25... 150-ish, 140 years ago? So, quite a few generations ago. And if I'm... I'm positive he had something to do with World War II. I really hope I'm not <laughs> totally off here. Though we think of him as the quintessential Englishman, he was actually half American. Wait, hey! Hey, okay, hey, I like this guy. Half American, half English, okay. I didn't realize he was kind of uh, the Englishman's Englishman. Is that just an American thing? Or, or do citizens of the UK consider him English? But anyway, half American. Uh, now you have my attention. Okay, I can relate. His mother, Jenny, was the daughter of a wealthy New York stock speculator. Oh. His father, Lord Randolph Churchill, was of English nobility. How on earth did his parents meet each other? A New York, uh, something to do with stock. A <laughs> stock speculator. Sorry, daughter of a New York stock speculator. And English nobility met... Uh, and had Winston Churchill. What an unlikely story. And a major political figure. Oh. From his early school days, Churchill recognized the power of words. Throughout his life, he used them okay. with consummate skill. They never let him down. Wow, that's quite a statement. Is Winston Churchill known as a, a great speaker? A great orator? Uh, I know he was heavily influential in... Well, now I understand uh, UK politics, but I I'm interested in more. He first made a name for himself as a war correspondent in the 1890s, okay. covering conflicts in Cuba, northern India, the Sudan, and South Africa. War correspondent. That's like a, the hundred-year-ago version of a journalist or something. That's actually pretty cool, especially back in the day when... Uh, it was probably only more difficult to get around and do reporting like that. That's actually really, really cool. Though he never abandoned journalism. And honestly, when you think about it, a great way to build worldly experience and to probably, probably gain the respect of people, you know? You, you have a really tangible way that you've gone about the world, learned about it, reported about it and became one of the greatest historians of his age, Churchill ah. used his family connections and his own fame to launch himself into politics. Okay, so he had somewhat of a leg up because his father... I still don't know how his father and mother met. That's probably an interesting story. His father was a politician, 
uh, an important politician, or royalty. Sorry, was he royalty? I must know. English nobility. English nobility. Okay. Fair enough. Um, and then he was somewhat known as a historian, kind of popular. He had a little bit of a leg up because he was part of royalty. And that, you know, it wasn't totally handed to him by the sound of it. He kind of forged his own path with his leg up. I can respect it to become uh, involved in politics. His confident manner and matchless oratory marked him as a natural leader. Okay. 1914. I mean, I know, gosh, he, <laughs> I think the only thing a lot of Americans know him for is a bunch of quotes. There's always Churchill quotes, you know? Uh, especially now you can <laughs> get like, you know, fancy uh, Google images with fancy script to motivate you. And there's always Winston Churchill quotes. And World War I found him in the key position of First Lord of the Admiralty. First Lord of the Admiralty. I don't know what that is, so I don't know how important that role actually is. But he's obviously getting involved in the government, in World War I. Where he did much to modernize Britain's navy. In 1915, really? Churchill thought he could bring a speedy end to the war by opening a new front in Turkey, which he perceived as the weak link in the German alliance against the Allies. So, he seemed to have really, really, like, big ideas about, <laughs> no small matter, how he thinks World War I could be solved, ended, quicker. But was he in a position where he could actually influence any of that? Or for having such a big opinion on it? This led to the infamous Gallipoli campaign. Badly underestimating the fighting strength of the Turks, thousands of British, Australian, and New Zealand soldiers were killed in battles that proved to be every bit as indecisive and bloody oh. as the campaigns on Europe's Western Front. Oh. Churchill took the blame. Oh, I was, I was gonna say, did they listen to him? Uh, as the, what was his title again? First Lord of the Admiralty. I feel like I need to know what that is. First Lord of the Ring. <laughs> First Lord of the Rings, no. Of the, not Rings, <laughs> was Winston uh, a Lord of the Ring as well? Uh, was the political head of the English and later British Royal Navy. Okay, so that has a direct... Okay, he was directly responsible for some of the naval operations, military movements. So I see, I see now. He had ideas about fighting Turkey, and those ideas were listened to, and it didn't go well. And he got a lot of people possibly killed, which is unfortunate, to say the least. Very unfortunate. And people blamed him for it. So, was that the end of his career? Or, or what? Did he come back from this? Kind of mistake? As the campaigns on Europe's Western Front. Churchill took the blame. Okay. This was perhaps the low point of his life. Dismissed from the war cabinet, five yeah. months later he enlisted in the army, where he saw action in France. What? So... <sighs> He had like a kind of a nice position high up as in charge of a naval operations, Navy, had made decisions in World War I, was kind of disgraced or blamed for a kind of a lot of a failed battle attempt, if you want to phrase it like that. And then he decided to join the army? I feel like, I feel like he didn't. That's kind of respectable, like he was almost looking for a way to get his honor back or something, because he was already part of royalty, he was already part of, you know, a high up position, and then, from I mean, from what I can tell, from what I understand, it to then just drop all that and join the army, unless he was, mm, unless he was kind of hired in the army at a high rank already, but... You know, to go into active combat when he kind of probably didn't have to, unless he had to, is uh, admirable, I suppose. Five months later, he enlisted in the army, where he saw action in France. 
Okay. He rose again in British politics throughout the 1920s, making ah. money, as he always did, through his writing and speaking. So, one thing that always stayed with him, and probably got him out of trouble, and probably helped him get back from this, like, huge political pitfall, uh, was his ability to speak. His ability as an orator, if, as you will. That, like, was his trump card. Like... That's how he could accomplish whatever it is that he did accomplish later in life. As Adolf Hitler took power in Germany in the 1930s, Churchill was one of the first, and certainly the loudest voice in England, sounding the alarm. Okay. But it was an alarm few in England wanted to hear. Ah. The English had been traumatized, as had all of Europe, by the shocking amount of death and destruction of the First World War. Yeah. No one wanted to face the possibility that it could happen again. Oh, so we're, we're setting the stage for a position where Winston Churchill is saying, hey, everyone, we're, we're going to go to war again. This is going to happen. And the First World War was so fresh in everyone's mind, it was like, no one wanted to hear that, even if it did end up being true, and it did end up being maybe the course of action that had to be taken. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's what happened. Uh, I'm no historian, <laughs> but uh, people didn't want to hear it. And Churchill was one of those first people saying, hey, I know this sucks, but it's going to happen. Churchill, however, saw that a new confrontation with Germany was inevitable. Okay. And when the inevitable arrived, with the stunning German attack on France in May 1940, a desperate nation turned to him. He was ready. His weapons... A desperate nation turned to Churchill? What position was he in that the nation was turning to him? Um, yeah. Well, his pen, his voice, and his words. Okay. I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat, he told the House of Commons. There's a, there's a quote. I, <laughs> I should hang that on the, on the wall back there. I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. Uh, I don't even care what context. I can, I can uh, look at that before like a round of golf or something, a tennis match, and be like, yeah, this applies. Blood, tears, and sweat. And then you got Winston Churchill actually saying it when it matters to actually inspire some people for the horrors that wait ahead. In his first speech as Prime Minister. Whoa, 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 what? And sweat. He told the House of Commons in his first speech as Prime Minister. Prime Minister? How did... What... What, what did we skip here? What, 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 this, I feel like this came out of nowhere. Shouldn't there have been some explanation of his campaigning? I guess it was kind of explained by the narrator that people really loved and respected his speaking ability. And uh, his decisiveness in how he was saying, oh, I think we're going to have to fight this World War II thing. Uh, but yeah, he was, it, at May 3rd, 1940, Prime Minister of the UK. Well, now he has pretty much all of the power necessary to enact whatever strategy and uh, whatever he thinks is the proper course of action. So he's going to have a huge influence on World War II for the UK, that's for sure. Things quickly turned from bad to worse. Oh. France collapsed, Belgium surrendered, and a quarter of a million British soldiers barely managed to escape from Dunkirk. Oh my God, when is Tur Winston gonna catch a break? Or is this his fault? I, I'm sure uh, UK citizens are much more intimately familiar with the nuances around this, but I can't tell if we're trying to say that all this death and destruction and failure is because of Churchill, or if Churchill just got dealt a bad hand, or what. Even as the war news moved from dangerous to desperate to disastrous, Churchill never wavered. In okay. speech after speech, he infused the British with the spirit to fight on against Hitler's monstrous tyranny. Were the people receptive to these speeches of, oh, we need to fight, we gotta fight on. Don't worry that we've lost basically every battle so far in this video. 
I'm sure there's stuff that, that's not included in this explanation of uh, successes and triumphs of British soldiers and whatnot. But if you only saw this video, like from my perspective, if I only know this video, it just sounds like one failure after the next. And then Winston coming back and saying, don't worry, everyone. We got this. We got this. Like we're getting punched in the face over and over. <laughs> and Winston is there like saying, looking good, man. We're looking good. We shall not flag or fail, he said after Dunkirk. We shall go on to the end. We okay. shall defend our island, whatever the cost may be. We shall never surrender. Okay. The point about Churchill in 1940 is not that he stopped a German invasion, but that he stopped the British government making peace. If Churchill had not been Prime Minister, the pro-appeasement Foreign Secretary Lord Halifax would have been. So... The government, uh, the UK government wanted to negotiate some sort of peace and Winston Churchill was largely responsible for not allowing that to happen. It's not that he was pro-war, pro-fighting and death for his people. He, he didn't want that, obviously. No one wanted that. Uh, but he didn't want to settle this with peace. He wanted victory. Is that about the gist of it? Is that correct? But that he stopped the British government making peace. Okay. If Churchill had not been Prime Minister, the pro-appeasement Foreign Secretary Lord Halifax would have mm. been. We know mm. that Halifax was open to negotiating with Hitler. Oh, yeah, that's exactly what this is. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Think of how different history could have been if this Halifax had been Prime Minister instead, and he was perfectly open to negotiating with the Nazis. Wow, history... You know, in my ripe old age, <laughs> history is much more fascinating than the way they taught it to us in school. I don't know what they were doing back then. Uh, anyway, I could <laughs> go off into that tangent forever. We'd be mistaken to assume that the German Führer's terms would not have been reasonable. They probably would have been very reasonable, as Hitler wanted to fight a one-front war against Russia. And an agreement hmm. with Britain would have allowed him to do just that. Yeah, maybe it would have been a reasonable peace ag agreement with Britain and Germany. But then that would have, even if it didn't hurt Britain, it would have helped Germany. So probably best that that didn't happen. Churchill made this impossible. Hmm. Had he not rallied the British people in the face of defeat after defeat, preventing Hitler from concentrating his full efforts on Russia, right. the entire history of the free world would have been much different. Exactly. So maybe that's why the title of this video here is The Man Who Saved the Free World, I just realized. He's directly responsible for stopping the British government from uh, making peace with Germany, which would have allowed uh, Hitler, and Hitler and his armies to invade Russia, probably successfully, which would have had, you know, an infinite butterfly effect of craziness stemming down to now where who even knows what I'd be doing right now? I'd be wearing a big, tall, fuzzy hat or something. <laughs> I probably wouldn't exist if... Uh, in all honesty, the world would be just completely different. And undoubtedly much darker. Mm. Because of Churchill's efforts and the marvel- Look at him, he's throwing up a peace sign. Peace. He's throwing up a peace sign. Winston's kind of cool. <laughs> At least in this cartoon. Plus resilience of the British people. The United States had an unsinkable aircraft carrier, Britain, from which to mount the liberation of the European continent in June of 1944. Mm. For this, and so much more, free people everywhere can thank the greatest man of his age, Winston Churchill. Oh, well, I know where this narrator stands on this. He just called him the greatest man of his age. I mean, it sounds like Winston had some ups and downs. I would like to hear more about his kind of, what he's known for uh, in terms of successes in policy, um, but I'm Andrew Roberts. For Thank you, Andrew Roberts.
That was by PragerU. PragerU. Very nice. But luckily, I have this video here. Ha <laughs> ha! I came prepared, knowing that I'd have more questions. The top five defining moments of Winston Churchill's career. I think this will be very helpful in maybe throwing out some things about Winston, not just about his strict history, but maybe some details about the, the highlights of his career. Th that'd be perfect for me. Number five, his daring prison escape. What? When was he in prison? What, <laughs> what, are, what, are we, what are we talking about? Now I think he's cool. Now I think he's even cooler. My man, Winston Churchill, went to prison. Nice. And he escaped, apparently. Descended from the Dukes of Marlborough, the boy who would become the legendary Sir Winston Churchill was born in- Oh, Sir Winston Churchill. He was knighted. I mean, that makes sense. I didn't know that. I don't know many. I'm not too up to date with too many knights. I only know Paul McCartney. Andy Murray. <laughs> okay. Into an affluent aristocratic family. A potent and assertive figure his entire life, Churchill served as a military man and journalist in his 20s, and right. in 1899, when covering the Boer War, he was made a prisoner of war in Pretoria. Churchill's what? reputation had yet to precede him, but he would make a name for himself on the night of December 12th, 1899. During his young journalism career in those foreign lands, he was put a prisoner of war? Wasn't that worth mentioning in the other video? That's kind of worth mentioning. When he scaled the fence and made a daring escape through enemy territory. He what? had made fools of the enemy and Britain was immediately captivated. A legend was born. No he jumped over the fence and what? Just ran he ran a hundred miles home or something? I think by the sound of this, he got away. It was successful. That's if if that's true, that's incredible. That's amazing. That I his legendary feats at that point would have struck uh, motivation in my heart. Just hearing that. Number four, his speech on trade unions and trade disputes bill. Okay. Winston Churchill is known for his unflinching resolve, not his failings. And yet, without okay. this notable failure early in his political career, he might never have grown to become the illustrious orator he's remembered as today. Yeah, that's a good point. The fact that Churchill had so many dark hours in his life and in his career, and so many horrible things happen, and uh, he made a lot of mistakes, and yet he's known as this amazing individual in history. So that's kind of the fact that he could persevere and still like motivate people and uh, bring admiration to people's hearts despite all that is definitely an indicator of what he was capable of as a human. After returning home from the war, Churchill turned his sights on politics, becoming an MP by the age of 25. Oh, wow. Okay, so he was an MP first before he was Prime Minister. I don't know what age he was Prime Minister, actually. On April 22nd, 1904, he was giving an important and rather radical speech about trade unions and the trade dispute bill. Huh. Unfortunately, Churchill lost his train of thought mid-sentence and, <laughs> failing to regain it, thanked the members for listening and sat down in defeat. Oh man, I feel bad for him. I mean, that- I feel like that actually is not all that uncommon, even for great speakers. It's just a part of being human. Talking and then suddenly... You don't know what to say. <laughs> gotcha! You uh, suddenly lose your train of thought, and there have been times where I've experienced it. It's impossible to get it back, no matter how much- The more you try, you can't get the train of thought back. And Winston just was like, Thanks for listening, everyone. He just accepted it. <laughs> I can respect that. And took his seat. Oh, man. That was probably so awkward to be there in person. Oh, man. And I bet people who didn't like him probably loved it sitting there in the House of Commons. They were like, oh, look at this young noob. Can't even finish his uh, train of thought. Ha! But uh, he still went on to become Winston Churchill, so there's that. From that point on, he kept detailed notes with him and planned his speeches with care. I like that. 
a lot. That is something I would do. I would learn from the experience. And if you got to bring notes and you got to write little speeches down and look down at your notes or something, do it. Whatever you got to do to succeed. Number three, becoming prime minister. Yeah. Over the years that followed his 1904 speech, Churchill's reputation only continued to grow both within the military and in politics, though not always right. in the positive sense. In separate instances, right. he was both isolated within the Conservative Party and politically exiled. When, just like he had warned, Germany rearmed and returned as a hostile force, however, the once unpopular figure was suddenly essential to the nation once again. Okay, so there was some amount of, hey, this guy is someone we respect and we know he has it in him, he's a great speaker. And he was kind of right there at the right time for everyone to say, hey, Winston Churchill is our guy in our darkest hour, despite all the, all the bad things that may have happened. And when Britain's Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain's policy of German appeasement failed, Churchill, uh, who had been vocally opposed to this strategy, was named his successor. Oh, Though an okay. often controversial figure, the general feeling was that no man was better suited to lead during wartime. Right, right. Okay, okay. So the appeasement failed. And they're like, hey, Churchill is the anti-appeasement guy. He's the let's kick their butts guy. So we're gonna go with this. <laughs> I feel like I could write. I feel like I could write a history of Winston Churchill for morons book, <laughs> where people like me could read it and understand uh, in terms like that. Uh. Number two, choosing war over peace. Yeah. Though Churchill may have been selected for his military mind, war was not a foregone conclusion when he assumed the premiership. The War Cabinet of Britain met for days on end in May of 1940, and there were those present who wanted to negotiate an option recently offered by Italy, who, I mean, who wished to serve as a mediator between Britain and Germany. Imagine, though. Imagine being on this wartime cabinet. You're, in, you're part of the government in one of those times in history where you're going to decide if you go to war. And you know the implications of that. And you know that it's going to boil down to you and these other guys, these other human beings around you at a table are going to decide if we're going to war. Just, I'm not commenting on if, uh, that, if it was a right decision, wrong decision. I'm just saying, just imagine being faced with that decision. And it is important to have people like Churchill that at least make a decision it's probably better than making no decision is making a decision kind of i'm sure there were people that were kind of in that school of thought too when they were uh, pro churchill but churchill would have none of it instead he led the country through war many mm. of his greatest speeches would be delivered in the months to follow including we shall fight on the beaches their finest hour blood toil tears and sweat and mm, the few. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you're gonna be at war and in a horrible situation, having a, a leader of your nation who is a wonderful speaker is such a fantastic bonus. Because humans are so psychological. No matter the horrors that they're facing, you can just have someone like Winston Churchill talk to the people. And that alone, no matter what horrors are happening, just helps a person find peace just at a psychological level rather than having some leader who's not very good at talking they're just kind of relaying the facts to you and you're just going kind of like uh this is our guy huh so being a great speaker is actually far more important than a lot of things it turns out number one his victory over germany mm. suffice to say the war was not easily won and when Britain yeah. had its back against the wall, there are surely those who doubted the decision Churchill made when he chose to fight. But right. in the end, England and its allies prevailed over Hitler, fascism, and the Axis powers. And that yeah. victory was in no small yeah. part thanks to Churchill's fearless leadership. They right. had survived Dunkirk, the Battle of Britain, and the Blitz, 
And on May 8th of 1945, yeah. now remembered as VE Day, they officially triumphed. When Churchill told the crowds uh. at Whitehall that it was their victory, they reportedly roared back, No, it is yours. Wow. Honestly, imagine being Churchill, being Prime Minister, not knowing what the hell you're doing, if it's right or wrong, and then finally, years later, I'm sure by then he was so, God, over it all, war and conflict, that it was like a bittersweet feeling, but he was probably pretty darn relieved that in, he at least got a positive outcome from all this, from having to make such a tough decision, so that's pretty cool. I also had one more video here. Uh, Sir Winston Churchill's fighting speech to U.S. Congress. I didn't choose this because it's to U.S. Congress or I just picked a random speech because I just kind of wanted to hear Winston Churchill speak. I just wanted to see what it was like, the, the tonality, the presentation. A charge with the direction of the war to overcome at the early moment the military, geographical, and political difficulties. And I don't know how old he is here, and if his style of speech-making changed or not. And begin the process so necessary and desirable. He has a really good uh, pattern to his speech, pacing as well. It's, it's not slow, but it's not quick. And his voice is very piercing. Like, when he's talking, he's the one talking. So, I can I can already tell he has numerous aspects to just his voice and physical presence and his delivery that makes him a great natural uh, speaker. Of laying the cities and other munition centers of Japan in ashes, for in ashes they must surely lie before peace comes back to the world. And he puts emphasis on a lot of words. Uh, a lot of words in the middle of the sentence. Da 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 Like a very, very intentional pattern to his talking. Let no one suggest that- And he also just sounds like he knows what he's set talking about. He's very confident in what he's saying. And when someone's just confident talking like this, you're inclined to b believe they know what they're talking about. And what they're saying is true. If it, even if it is or isn't, just the delivery has such a huge impact. We have, we British, <clears throat> have not at least as great an interest as the United States in the unceasing and relentless waging of war against Japan. And ah, there is something about the way he delivers the words. It's always in this tone of, man, of friend like reaching out friendship like he's not being hard he's being harsh without being harsh i don't i don't know how to explain it uh he's delivering it in like a very confident not aggressive manner a semi aggressive but it's polite and like earnest like asking you to listen to what he's saying i don't know i that's what i get when i when i listen to him just from this very brief very brief uh video uh, but I can totally see why he was known as a good speaker. Yeah, totally. Anyway, uh, I definitely learned a ton from these videos on Winston Churchill. I'm very glad I watched these because I knew he was a huge figure in world history. We, I've heard his name many, many times. Lots of history buffs in America are, know all about him. I think it's really just a me thing that I didn't, I wasn't familiar with Winston Churchill. And, you know, don't get me wrong, <laughs> a lot of other Americans probably don't know anything about him either. But uh, this isn't like not knowing the difference between the UK and Great Britain, where every American is confused. Uh, Amer Americans are aware of Winston Churchill, and I can see why. He was pretty, pretty darn pivotal in the world wars and in uh, UK history. So, I totally get it. And uh, my respect, I, I enjoyed learning about him, for sure. Anyway, if you enjoyed listening to this video, <laughs> feel free to give it a like or leave a comment. And uh, if you're interested in more videos like this, me reacting to UK and British culture, history, 
new news, places, things that I've never seen. Feel free to subscribe for more. And until then, thanks for watching and see you next time.